Hey guys, it's Lizzie and I'm at the Natural History Museum in London. This wonderful museum is famous for its dramatic architecture, incredible dinosaur skeletons and thousands and thousands of amazing specimens. But most of the specimens at this museum aren't actually on show. Instead, they are kept here because onto the back of the main museum is this, the Darwin Centre. This is the state-of-the-art research facility with over 25 kilometres of shelving containing glass jars of preserved animal specimens. And they've got all sorts from giant squid to goblin sharks and they've even got a Shetland pony. Over the years, scientists have collected them for research and all of them can be found here. So we're in the tank room and I'm here with Ollie who's going to show me some of his hidden treasures. Now Ollie, this room is full of jars but we're not going to be looking at the jars, are we? can do, but the tanks are the special feature of this room. We can keep whole specimens. Oh my the goodness. <laughs> Look at the size of that. So that's a large South American fish, um, Arapaima, and this one was kept in London Zoo Aquarium for many years. I used to watch it as a youngster. So sure. There's so many interesting ones in here. I can see a ray down this end. Yes, this is um, an eagle ray. It's a stingray, you can see the, the stings on the, on the tail. I guess what strikes me is just the condition of them. How were they preserved? Well, they were initially fixed in formaldehyde, but now that stops all the degradation process, stops them rotting, basically. Then the tissues are impregnated with alcohol, and that replaces the water in the cells, and we know that that will keep specimens for hundreds of years. <music> So I had to pull the gloves on, Ollie, because there's one specimen in here which I absolutely am fascinated by, the monkfish. Look at this guy. They're an angler and trying to lure prey within reach by waggling this, and anything that comes to investigate that um, gets caught when the mouth opens up. And that lure is particularly small, so when you compare it with the deep sea angler, why deep is Deep sea anglers are closely related, but they're in darkness, so they must light theirs up. There are luminescent bacteria living in this bulb and in the fronds. The female wants to present this crowd of what probably looks like little luminous shrimps and anything that comes to investigate is unaware of the mouth waiting below. And so the male, when you compare it to the female, not very impressive. He's called a parasitic male and relies on finding a female by following a scent trail. He's just there really to fertilise the eggs when she lays them. He bites into her skin the tissues fuse and he's then dependent on her for his nutrition. It's a way of sticking together in a huge space. Although we know that three quarters of the world is covered with water at the surface, the depth of the ocean, the great depth of the ocean, means that 98.5% of all living space on Earth is actually underwater. And these animals have the problem of finding each other and finding food in a vast space and when a male finds a female, they stick together for life. Is it true that in this cupboard are some of the type of specimens collected by Darwin himself? These were all collected by Darwin. Oh. These are just a fish, of course. I can't believe these are the actual specimens. Yes, so Charles Darwin's own specimens. So what actually is a type specimen? Why do we need them? A type specimen is the means by which you represent the species that you're describing as new to science. The process of making that known, putting it on the map, if you like, is to make a species description, describe its features, nominate this one good specimen that you show, think shows the good features. Okay. So London um, was a, a good secure repository where a lot of scientists wanted to put the type specimens for further reference and that's why we have such extensive collections. <laughs> Okay, so on our left we have a monstrous mollusk. This is, of course... Now these are deep sea squids. Look at that, from the tip of the tentacle all the way down here. This must be... It's how long do you reckon? The whole thing is eight metres long. And it's an impressive tank for an impressive species. Yeah, yeah. Right. Wow, okay, so moving on, we've got one more to show me, and I'm quite excited about this one. Um, talk me through the, the specimens you have here. Well, um... Looking at these larger jars of um, fishes, we've got in this one here a coelacanth. So 
only known from a fossil record. It wasn't thought that coelacanths were with us anymore until 1938, one was discovered off the coast of South Africa, alive. That's, so That must be so exciting for the person who found it. It was, in, indeed. And it caused a great deal of uh, a stir in the press. It's probably the most famous of all fishes. And now, in fact, there's another species being discovered in Indonesia. So there are two living oh, coelacanth wow. species on Earth. Do you think there's more? More species of coelacanth? I couldn't believe it when the second one was uh, discovered. <laughs> because Many people would phone up and say, I've got an unusual fish and I think it's a coelacanth. And of course, it never was. <laughs> so I was a bit sceptical, but yeah. it turned out to be true. So in this room, we have, what, a few thousand of the 20 million. Why aren't they out on display for the public to see? People w would love to see this, I'm sure. They do, and yeah. the, the museum is, in recent years, I think, better at displaying our research to the public. So, for instance, this um, Darwin Centre building, we make ourselves much more visible in, than in the old-fashioned buildings that we had here. And there are many places in the galleries, for instance, where you can see through to the scientific work being done. Well, absolutely fantastic. And in terms of the museum being the wonder of nature or the hub of nature, sh showcasing everything in the world, I think it does pretty much that. Well, we try. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have to say, that's probably been one of the most weird but wonderful things I've ever done. And we've only just scratched the surface of these incredible zoological collections. And I'll definitely be back but I'd also love to hear your thoughts on these spooky spirit collections and if you're new around here make sure you subscribe to BBC Earth and Plug to learn heaps more about this wonderful natural world. I'll see you next time. <laughs>